ինքը անկման արդյունքում բոլորը ստարապում ենք խախտված սերականությունից None of us are sexually whole. Ոչ ոք մեզանից սերական ամբողջականություն չէ։ Because like every other aspect of our humanity, we are broken Կանի որ ճիշտ այնպես, ինչպես մեր մարդկության բոլոր բաղարիչները անկում ապրեցին մեղտից հետո եւ փչացան, ճիշտ այնպես մեր սերականությունը։ And as a result of our sexual brokenness and our brokenness in every other dimension of humanity, Եվ ի արդյունք մեր սերական կոտրվածության եւ մարդկության աշխարի ցակացած Thirdly, as a Christian, and we're going to talk about this later on today. I'm committed, I'm deeply, deeply committed to the following three things. Number one, I'm committed as a follower of Jesus Christ to honoring God's truth in every dimension of my life. Ես խորապես նպատակ եմ սահմանել Աստծո խոսքի ճշմարտությունները պատվելու կյանքի յուրաքանչյուր որորդի վերաբերում։ Իբրեւ Հիսուսի հետևոտ ես հանձն եմ արել Հիսուսի սերը արտացոլել բոլոր հարաբերություններում, որոնց շրջապատում եմ։ And as a follower of Jesus Christ, I am committed to upholding and promoting the dignity of every human being. Իբրեւ Հիսուս Քրիստոսի հետեւոտ ես հանձն եմ առել բարձրացնել ու մեծարել գնահատել ցանկացած մարդու արժանապատվությունը։ And I will uphold and promote that dignity in spite of that person's sinful choices. մարդու արժանապատվությունը կգնահատեմ ու կբարձրացնեմ անկախ իր մեղավոր որոշումներից Jesus Christ despises all sin Հիսուսը ատում է բոլոր տեսակի ըղկերը Jesus Christ does not great sin on earth Հիսուս Քրիստոսը դասակարգումներ չունի մեղքի He despises all sin Նա ատում է բոլոր տեսակի մեղքերը He despises whatever sin diminishes the image of God in me. Այն բոլոր տեսակի մեղքեր է, որ աստծո պատկերը իմ մեջ, այդ մեղքերը, որոնք նվազեցնում են, խաթարում են այդ պատկերի ամբողջականությունը, ադելի է Հիսուսի։ And I want to move in and among my relationships. Ու ես ուզում եմ հարաբերություններում անդադարի կսից հիշեցնել, որ ես աստծո ողորկության կարիքն ունեմ։ Because like Paul, I am the chief of sinners. Քանի որ ինչպես բողոսը, այնպես էլ ես մեղավորներից մեծագույնն եմ։ I have been redeemed from my sin. Ես փրկագնվել եմ իմ մեղքերից Հիսուսի արյամբ։ And God has adopted me as his son. Եվ աստված որդեգրել է իմ իբրեւի որդին։ But I am still a sinner in the name of God. Մեղավոր եմ, որը կարիք ունի աստծո կանոնավոր ողորկությանը։ I love all people. Սիրում եմ բոլորին։ Չորրորդ գետը սիրում եմ բոլորին։ And I want the very best for everyone that I Եվ ես ուզում եմ բոլորի համար լավն եմ ուզում, որոնց վրա կարող եմ ազդեցություն ունենալ։ Նախ եւ առաջ, գերագույն ցանկությունը է, որ այն բոլորը, որի բոլորը, որի հետ կարող եմ շփվել, ունենան հնարավորություն Հիսուսի թակավորություն մտնելու։ Հիսուսի այդ հարաբերությունը ունենալ։ God's grace this is the motive out of which I want to operate. 
and reach a people at the same time. If you hate, if you hate homosexual people, you will never be inclined to reach those same people. If you hate an ethnic group, you will never be inclined to reach that ethnic group. If you hate evil people, people who are desperately in need of redemption through the blood of Christ, there will never be any motivation within your heart to move toward those people to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I am unable to move forward in mission, I am now guilty of defying one of God's great purposes for my life. So I'll leave it at that. Those are my five statements. The second thing that I want to address this morning is the issue of my comment yesterday about justice. Եվ երբ մի բան եվ սվորոսում այսը հատնադարվան երեկ իչ մեկ արդարության մասին, բանջի մասին հոսկենց։ Արդում եմ չուրը բրնում է եղել։ So I want to try and correct the misunderstanding. I shared the story yesterday of 9-11, September 9-11. September 9-11. And um, I told you the story about where I was the day that those two airplanes flew in the And I shared with you my reaction to My reaction of anger. My reaction of a desire for revenge. My reaction that someone has to pay for this. Now, some of you heard that and you think to yourself, well, that's not right. That's not right to hate people who do it. That's not right to feel anger some of you may have felt that way. Some of you may have felt that I was being very vengeful and hateful. And I would, I would suggest maybe a, perhaps a different way to think about this. And one of the places that we see this expressed um, probably best is in the Psalms. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples. Listen to the words of David in Psalm 73. Actually, it's not written by David. It's written by a man by the name of Asaph. But but here's what Psalm 73 says. It pulls us into this issue. Which verse? It begins in verse 1. The psalmist is before God. He's expressing what's in his heart. In honesty, in honor before God. He says, surely, surely God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. It's almost as if the psalmist has, is in doubt of the goodness and the mercy of God. And he's calling into doubt the goodness and mercy of God because he's looking out on his world. 
And he's being honest with us about da. his condition. He's telling us his feet almost slipped out from under him. He's, he's trying to hang on to his faith in the goodness and mercy of God. But when he goes out of the world, and he sees the kind of horrifying evil that are being he's questioning, he's wondering, where is God in the midst of this? Where is God in the midst of this? Horrific injustice. He said, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the Lord. Here, here's what he's saying. He's saying, I look around the world and I see wicked people. They get away with murder. They get away with violence. No one's holding them accountable. And he's angry. Now let me ask you to be honest with me. Have you ever felt that way? Do you get that God selects us? Yes. I felt that way. I felt that way on 9-11. Yes, that I was guilty in the past to make it definitely. You feel that way about the Armenian genocide? You sometimes say to yourself, where was the justice in there? I feel that way about the Armenian genocide. Now here's the problem we have in the church. Here's the problem. We make that kind of anger. We conclude immediately that that kind of anger is sinful. And so here's what happens. When the people express that kind of anger, we shake our finger at them. You shouldn't do that. Join us. We shame people because they feel that way. But friends, if we do that, you got a major problem with your Bible. You got a major problem with your Bible. Because about half of the Psalms are prayers processing that kind of anger. And not once, not once as far as I can tell, does God shame the plaintiff? For his anger. For his feelings of anger over the miscarriage of justice. Instead, what we discover. And what the Psalms teach us about is that when those feelings arise, which, which if you live life long enough, they will arise. What we are encouraged to do is not to go and exact revenge on our enemies. To not go and hate those who are the perpetrators of evil. Instead, we are encouraged to bring our anger, our frustration, our miscarriage of justice before the God whose foundation is faithfulness and justice. You see what's happening in Psalm 73 and many other Psalms. Look at Psalm 94. I read this morning. Same thing. The psalmist is processing. He's saying, these people, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued with human ills. 
Pride is their necklace. From their callous hearts comes forth iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. And he's saying there's something wrong with this picture. The scales need to be righted and they are And then there's a turning point in this story. The psalmist says, when I tried to understand all of this, it was, it was a blessing until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And when I went into the sanctuary of God, I righted myself. It's got my feet back under me, my feet that were about to I got stabilized when I went into the presence of God. And I remember that this God that I love, He will one day. Me or He will one day. Me or He will one day. Me or but today is not that day. But watch, I search. He will write the scales. Me or Pisti Shotki Artarutia Kushakari. And therefore my role was the ear there is not to exact revenge. Vereshanti Linele Che is not to move forward in hatred. Adelutia Paraj Ganala Che. But to continue to let my heart radiate. The love of Christ. And let God be God. Because He will bring before His throne every person. Amen. And they will bow down before Him. They will kneel in His presence. And they will declare. That he is king of kings. Amen. Friends, if we do not, if we do not remember this, what will happen to our hearts? Is there will be a hardening. Because that's what revenge does. It will calcify your heart. And so here's my encouragement. When people in your church come to you and they're angry about the miscarriage of justice, about the unfairness of life, about the fact that people seem to be getting away with all kinds of evil and not having to pay for it, we should not be Berating them, and beating them, and reprimanding them, and shaming them. Instead, what we ought to be doing is saying, take your pain to God. Remember that vengeance is mine. And that one day, as you bring your lament, be reminded that one day, one day, but today is not that day, God will make all things right. Amen. You with me? Yes. 
Okay, quickly. No. Let me address the two issues regarding Genesis. The first is in Genesis 4. And I mentioned to you in this particular uh, in this particular chapter that there is uh, immorality and it regards a man by the name of Lamech in Genesis chapter 4. And what Lamech does is Lamech shows complete disregard for the life of other people. He does exactly what we've just been talking about. He decides to exact revenge. And he exacts revenge on a man because the man had wounded him. Verse 23. He shows a blatant disregard for life. And he not only kills a man for injuring him. But verse 19 says that he defies the one man, one woman principle. He takes on not one wife, but he takes on two wives. This this is in the context of a post-fall condition. And it's evidence of the moral deterioration of the human race. That's what I was referring to yesterday. And then in chapter 6, there was a question about sexual perversion. And this is in reference specifically to the first couple of verses of the chapter. Verse 1 of chapter 6 tells us that when men began to increase the number of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married of them that they choose from the church. We know that from Genesis chapter 128, God commanded Adam and Eve to multiply. And this act of multiplication was a couple is commended by God as being something that's beautiful and good. God mandates that we populate the earth. This is a good thing. Genesis 1. But this passage reveals that this mandate or this command that God has given it, it led to increasing levels of wickedness among men. And Genesis 6 is an example. Now, we don't have time today to go into all the details. There's lots of discussion about this passage. There's all kinds of proposals. You can read all kinds of theological books. There is, there is a lack of agreement across the board about this passage. Who are these sons of men? Sons of God. There's all kinds of sophisticated answers to this. What, what is clear 
Mas vivamos isso aqui. Is that the kind of relationship that's described here is 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 depicted as some form of grievous sexual sin. Ai pat kere bora este unde kara gervume seragan berki pes energiatsvum. The language indicates that there is some kind of sexual perversion going on here. Ai stef testume por seragan khegatsurvats Shervats, where men, men are forcefully taking women for their own sexual pleasure. Forcing themselves. They're choosing whoever they want. It's a form of sexual abuse. Sexual. To use modern language, there, there's sexual assault in this passage. And this assault is in defiance of what God revealed in Genesis 1. Something good in God's creation is taken, that is, propagation and the bearing of children. And it's moved outside the boundaries of the And therefore becomes a perversion of that which is good. By the way, this is usually what sin is. Sin is in many cases is taking something that God originally intended. And beautiful. And moving it outside the boundaries of what's good and beautiful. And perverting it. And that seems to be what's going on here in this case. So I, I wanted to just bring some clarity to these issues before we move on. Now, I, I would imagine that it probably raises some questions. We will have at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Okay. All right. We're going to move on and let me just let me just pause to review where we came yesterday. We're talking about the story of God. And one of the things that I mentioned yesterday, we must learn to read God's story as God writes his story. We must learn to begin God's story where God begins his own story. We can't get ahead of the story. We can't skip over the story. Because the Bible is 66 books, each telling a different aspect or facet story. We're not jumping into the details of those 66 books. We've flown up to about 20,000 feet and we're trying to get a big picture of the larger story. Remember the illustration that I used yesterday? That when you have an understanding of the larger story of the Bible, it's like what goes on behind the curtain in a play. Pretend, pretend that I'm walking behind the curtain. The big story. Is operating behind the curtain. 
funzione vale a cui io devo mettermi io. So that when I come forward and try and bring forth a specific story, io devo forse fare un ricerche o un concreto di battuzione del caso. What's informing that story? Ah, battuzione vuol dire che c'è un mese del caso, ma mi ci rimane per aie. It's the larger story. Io non abbiamo un terreno di so, ma vedi in mezzo battuzione arzio. And lots of people, including pastors, shut up the gun, come over with this. Have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, they have no idea what the story is. So when they come to the smaller story, What's the first part of the story? But we tell about the most important part of the story. The created image. Starts with what? The created image. It's not sin. Mer kits chiskas umas to bat mitzunah. It's not the fall. Angu mits chiskas. It's not all the ugly stuff that we see that happened as a consequence of Adam and Eve in the garden. Ada miuri ebi mer kai artukum starts with the gear pan and its chiskas to bat mitzunah. God sets up. Sets up. Sets up. Chist. Nishana galat nello. And it's pointing us forward. Yeb ain mes ugon tume de biarat. I have a glorious place, a glorious future, a glorious life, a glorious purpose. And we must not forget, because God has not forgotten. As we're going to see as we go forward. Then we came to the second part. What was that? The cracked image. The image, however, has not been eliminated or obliterated. It's been diminished. It's been disfigured. But the essence of the image of God is still there. And we see this in things like justice. And our longing for a transcendent relationship with something. And our desire Community and relating to and our love of beauty. These are all echoes. When you think about it, the And then we came to the story of the Tower of Babel. And we said at the Tower of Babel that the sin was not the building of the tower. What upset God most was the people's desire to build a tower to their own egos to remain as one people with one language in one place. And so God comes down, He destroys the tower. He confuses the language. And what does he do to the people? What does he do with the people? And all of this is intended to bring us to this point in the story. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 12. Because we're going to come this morning to the third major theme, and that's the theme of community, of community. I saw considering yellow or whatever thematic I must see, but not mine. And I, I have often said this. Yes, I just must say. 
This particular part of God's story begins in Genesis 12 and takes us all the way through the end of the book of Malachi. It's the Old Testament story. So if you're looking for where the story is told, it is in from Genesis chapter 12 all the way through to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Ieti aizpat pēc atdeļa pat regimācīt, aizpat pēc jūs, kas mēs varam tos tās nekusīts, viņš šēvā, viņa tā kā nivērķa, mākā ievērķa. This is a very, very large section of your Bible. Sācīrās atdās ir šī mīs šādi. It comprises uh, probably about two-thirds of your Bible. And what is interesting about this particular portion is that this is most often the part of our Bibles that we read, that we read the least. We love those opening chapters of Genesis. We love the New Testament. But when it comes to the Old Testament, most of us read it and we scratch our heads and we go, what? I don't understand this. This is weird. There's portions of it that we understand, but the overall picture of what God 